Okay. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry, my audio is going out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, Anish, can you can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah. Okay. It's uh, I had, yeah. I had to log out and log back in. I don't know what happened there. Yeah, I had the same issue. Uh, that, that, that's good. I was a little worried I'd have to do the whole panel myself. Ask that's the awesome. experts without you the experts. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I guess we can get started. It's it's 4 p.m. Eastern time. So, um, yeah. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the privacy and data governance track, Ask the Experts. Um, today, we have a bunch of super talented and awesome people on the panel. Um, the first member of our panel is Jamie Parkour. Um, she is leading in compliance for compliance and process for service delivery, and she has 12 years of experience in the whole in the space. Um, we also have Jay Kohler. Hopefully I said the last name right. Um, she's new to Red Hat, but she has over 15 years of experience um, in industry uh, related to security. Um, we also have Florencio Cano. <laughs> um, and he is a senior product security an analyst at Red Hat. Um, lots of experience with familiar cloud services and well, he has a good 20 years of experience. I think back then I was still, still in school. <laughs> uh, finally, we have Uday. Um, he is part of product management for our AIML workloads at Red Hat um, and for the hybrid cloud. I'm not sure how many years of experience that he has, but I'm assuming it's just as much as everyone else. Uh, finally, you have me. I'll be moderating the panel today. Um, yeah, my name is Anisha Sana, and I'm a software engineer on Jay's team at Red Hat, so in the AI services organization. Cool. Um, I guess I'll kick things off. Um, in terms of our planning for the panel, we were hoping to sort of focus more on supply chain security, um, and that's kind of what we'll be starting off with. That isn't to say you can't ask questions about anything you're interested in, so please ask about anything you're curious about. Um, this is just some things we came up with a plan for. So with that, we can open the floor. Um, does, well, well, the first question I prepared is, what is the supply chain we're referring to when we're talking about security and um, why do we care about it? Well, I can I can start if if you will say uh, the we have been talking about the supply chain security in the last year more maybe more than previously. Now it seems that we are more aware that we have to have our software secure, but also our software and solutions depend on third-party components, sometimes closed and sometimes open. And the security of those components are very relevant for the security of our solution. So we cannot just rely on the other components to provide security, but we have to do also a proactive things we have to plan our security how we include new components and also how we protect our own pipeline the security of our own pipeline so i think uh, open source has some advantage there also some challenges and uh, that is a uh, a main concern, I think, for all the industry these days. Cool. Um, could you could you elaborate on some of the challenges or advantages of open source in this picture? Really, I'm asking you, but like anyone on the panel again. So. 
Well, uh, sorry, go on, please. Oh, th thanks, Francis. So, yeah, I, I can kick it off for the open source part, right? I, I think uh, I see a couple of uh, major challenges and advantages to from and, and to start with the, the open source uh, development model, which is let's develop fast, fail fast, and go back and retry. That's really great to get the software out the door, but is it really uh, a well thought out process from a security perspective is one thing we have to really look at, right? A lot of software, open source software projects rely on or use components from other areas that are also open source. And, and if you don't have a policy on which ones to pick and which to not pick, you may or may not be picking the right component or even the right version of the component to use in, in, your, pro in your project. And that may create security holes, right? So uh, that's both uh, a good and a bad thing. The, the good thing is you have choice, and, and which means you can get software out fast with open source that's secure. But choice also creates a responsibility uh, to do some due diligence. So security in open source is one area where, in fact, we may need to slow down and think which components to use and what the impact of them is. And to that point, would you also say that um, you know, understanding that community, the open source, how often they are updating, um, you know, how, you know, are they addressing their security issues and those sorts of things is, what do you think about that from an importance perspective? Absolutely, Jay. So one of the critical things when you look at not just security, but any aspect of, of picking an open source community is look at how vibrant the community is, how fast they update and what kind of support does it have, right? Is it a single vendor driven who just puts code out there? Is it a real community in, in the collaborative sense that there's multiple people with different expertise levels developing it? Certainly a, a vibrant community always guarantees the fresh uh, and new software coming out on time, right? So that's a critical aspect to look at. Yeah, and then I was, so now I'm coming to Jamie. I'm <laughs> I'm sorry, but I have these thoughts. Uh, since I am kind of new to the open source too. And one of the things that I've recently learned is that from a, a PII perspective, there's a, con there's a concern there too, you know, when we're selecting our vendors, et cetera, you know, what kind of information are they potentially gathering and that sort of thing. Jay, uh, what does PII stand for? Uh, personal identifiable inter information. <laughs> I wasn't right. quizzing you. I, I just, yeah. <laughs> just want to make sure we all are aware. Yeah, no, thank you for that, Anish. Yeah, I think it's something that we all think about, right? I mean, especially when you see, um, especially the headline news, right? Uh, a lot of security breaches. Um, so, Uday, I was going to ask you and maybe Florencio, like, you know, how how do you kind of influence and kind of work with the community to think about privacy by design, right? So that's really what it it boils down to is, you know, how are you incorporating like the opt-in or opt-out? Do you understand where the data is going um, when you are making an update, right? Do you have to put in some sort of control, right? So how, how do you work with our communities um, to kind of, you know, uh, work through what is the best way to think about privacy by design? I think that uh, something that on the security industry we have done wrong in the past is to be like uh, against uh, developers in the sense that we want to put uh, gates, we want to put controls and we slow down uh, the work they do. Uh, so we have to, f we are fixing that and we, we have to continue improving. We have to give good advice on which security controls can be implemented by default to, impro to improve privacy, good mental models, good things that are aligned with being agile and with being fast. It is possible. It is a challenge because the easy way on security is saying no. Uh, you can do that. Uh, I have to review this before you can continue. That is the easy thing. The difficult thing is to define architectures that are secure by default, uh, paradigms that uh, take care of uh, the privacy and data of users. So uh, we have to improve as an industry, I, I think so, about security. We have to, to go to the next level to, to have a better portfolio of security controls. And if we explain 
that, that what we do is for improving privacy and what we recommend has sense, communities understand that. If we try to impose security controls that uh, don't take into account what they are doing, uh, how they work and agility is when friction happens. So it is about thinking, thinking a lot, how to improve, how to be uh, agile and, uh, and fast and at the same time, at the same time, protect privacy. It, it can be done, but it is, it is a challenge, but it is, uh, that's why it's good and, and funny to be here now. <laughs> In fact, Florence, to, to add to that point, there's something we've been discussed at DevConf last year, right? This also brings the need to, to bring in more uh, technical people, but that not just programmers or software engineers into our communities, right? Software engineers write great code, but we need these technical experts and domain experts that can provide the framework so you can speed up development, but also remain within the realm of the security and the set guidelines, right? We do need to expand communities to include some of their expertise beyond just software engineering. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think one, one way of doing this is like uh, including these controls on the CI, CD pipelines, for example, automating things, what we have uh, named shift left. So instead of doing a security review at the end, like a security gate, maybe it is better to continuously scan the code while it is being developed and give these insights, this information to developers uh, in real time, if it is possible, or when they do a, a, a pull request or a push to, to a repo, but as soon as possible on the development lifecycle. I think in this space too, it's it's really challenging because the requirements are always changing, right? And what is really your benchmark? Is it, you know, you're taking a global point of view? Are you looking in a specific region? Um, you know, I think especially in the privacy space, it's really evolving and ever changing. Um, and how do we kind of, you know, think about privacy by design with the automation that would, you know, um, support, you know, this the fast moving privacy kind of landscape, if you will. Yeah, um, may, maybe outing myself here. I don't usually think a lot about these things when I'm working um, or just writing my code, right? I'm like, well, someone will catch a dead review or someone else will yell at me later <laughs> and we'll fix it eventually. So, like, I think I probably agree with like having a more proactive approach to these things. Um, yeah, go ahead. I definitely think it's like a um, just an opportunity for us to really collaborate together, um, just to do like amazing things in this space. Because you know, I think you know, sitting in engineering, you know, sometimes you don't know what you don't know, right? And being able to kind of just be a little bit more connected, just to the higher level things, right? It doesn't need to get into the weeds of a compliance expert, um, but just, you know, having a little bit more awareness of where the data is flowing, um, you know, how, what's the impact, um, you know, how would the customer, you know, respond to this? How would an individual respond to this? You know, just kind of thinking about those key things, I think just helps in general. I was thinking also, uh, Jamie, about the, uh, what you mentioned about the different requirements and the, uh, this is continuously changing, the, the compliance uh, goal and the compliance requirements. That's a problem that we have to, to face. But I think that uh, there are some um, core uh, values or core things that are always present that like information should be accessed only by people that need to access that information or is authorized but to access that information that is always the same in gdpr in iso 27001 that are those that i know more but I, i'm sure that in others that i don't know hipaa and others uh, are similar so people that need to access and has a need to know probably they 
are allowed to access. Probably you need to have somewhere a log with the ac who has access when to the data. So with some principles, maybe you comply with a lot of uh, compliance requirements, but the difficulty is to yes to to extract these core things you have to do, map them to all the compliance, and also to be uh, to know all these uh, different law, laws and regulations that may apply to you. Florencio, I think uh, maybe changing just a little bit on the topic here, because when we were talking before, I, you know, I, I, I think what you do is so, so important here at Red Hat, but um, I also wanted to have you maybe comment, you know, from a, when we talk about developers, um, in my experience, a lot of times, you know, things that may look minor, you know, in one piece, you know, oh, well, maybe we don't need to fix that, or that's just a minor over here. Do you want to touch on a little bit? I think we talked about, you know, those minor things all add up together uh -huh. can sometimes be catastrophic. Yeah, that is something that, especially on cloud services, uh, can have a big impact. Vulnerabilities that in we we are, uh, we have been analyzing vulnerabilities in the past for individually each one. So we have the CVSS that is a calculation of the um, the severity of the vulnerability, but from an individual point of view of only seeing the vulnerability. But these minor vulnerabilities combined on a service, on a system, on, on, on a company, uh, together can make a big impact, a big severity. And that is difficult to, to see. I, as an, as an analyst, I try to see the whole picture, but it is uh, difficult to see it individually. So this minor vulnerability today, maybe that we maybe can accept at, as is or not prioritize to be fixed, but maybe together with other minor vulnerabilities tomorrow, put at risk the whole system or the whole service. Uh, that is this. That is a challenge. We, there are proposals to to have more information about this, like uh, attack vectors or uh, attack flows, but it is very, very, very difficult. So this maybe lets me pivot, perhaps a little ungracefully, to my next question, which is sort of like you know, with this whole shift to cloud, cloud services, and you know, like, and context serving open source, right? Things like Kubernetes are huge in private industry. Um, do you see in this, uh, government certifications or requirements changing in the future uh, in the context of like open source projects like Kubernetes? When you look at certifications, one aspect to think through is is that are you certifying the technology or are we looking at uh, the products of a specific iteration of the technology which is branded as a product by a company or even the community right so when we look at certifications one one clear thing that both open source users and, and even companies need to differentiate is when you pass a security certification when they pass a standard that is specific to a version of the code probably a version of the product right so uh, from a threat assessment perspective both the users and admins need to be aware of that of that particular version where it was assessed for a threat and noted safe and this becomes even more complicated for certifications in the context of a solution right you have a few pieces of code from different projects and vendors interacting so clearly defining the entrop matrix of what can be used and what is tested and good to go in, in your in your deployment i think that's critical from a certification perspective if not it becomes a huge two by two or a three by three matrix that that's impossible to certify at some point I think that's a really, really good point. Um, you know, especially as we move into like the managed services, you know, space, you know, thinking about, you know, the platform, the product, um, you know, there's, there's so many things, um, and so many opportunities, right? So I can, I completely understand that. That makes sense. 
No, recently, the United States has issued this executive order that affects how we do some some things. I'm not specifically working on on that, but I know uh, the industry in general is looking, uh, is thinking how to comply with it, how to comply better with it, and it's a is something that we have seen with the the solar winds bridge recently uh, that we can do maybe not uh, better because maybe we are already doing uh, what it requires but make it more visible maybe inform other parties so i think it is something that is in, uh, continuously evolving uh, don't know if new certifications are coming but uh, the, the industry itself it it is obvious that we we have to do it better with or without legal requirements or certifications. I think it's definitely like sparked interest and in you know a little bit more focus in the space, right? Headline news always grabs the attention of everyone, but I think that we just need to think about it in a much different way than we ever have before. Um, you know, I think last year we talked about like the impacts of like COVID and privacy. And now you think about, you know, um, you have the pandemic on top of, you know, a, a, you know, even um, more, I don't say intelligent, you know, um, security breaches, you know, um, how do we get ahead of that? How can we be proactive? How do we put those guardrails up? Right. I mean, those are things that we think about every day and, um, you know, just any and maybe we could just do like a little brainstorming around like, you know, what um, what are some of the things that you think some of the developers should be thinking about, um, you know, as we kind of go through this, you know, uh, transition uh, with a focus on cybersecurity. I think that one important thing is improving what we are talking about, the, the, the supply chain, but specifically what we do on our secure development life cycle or secure, uh, secure um, way that we create information and uh, for the products and services that we ship to, to process it uh, with security on the pipelines. So that is, that is an, an important thing. Uh, I think we communities in general uh, do what they what they can and work with the tools they have in many different ways. But we have to put focus on adding security on those uh, development life life cycles to in uh, automating things. On if we do we do that when new requirements arrive when we have to improve anything it would be easier because uh, at the end there is the software in services in products uh, if we work on securing the software in general the security of everything will will improve mm -hmm. So, so yeah. for instance, here, Jimmy, uh, a, a quick uh, note, if you're on the topic, right? So, when you look, when you say software uh, supply chain security, it's just like from from the like the code, the production, the libraries you use, is your end product secure enough? Has it gone through enough testing, right? Uh, one other thing also that we've been noticing in some of the recent breaches is just that the software, the latest version or the newer versions may be secure, both in the community or uh, a product, but they just the users just haven't upgraded, right? It's probably there's a missing link where the, the, the supply chain has done its job, but the communication between the chain to the user where they get a notification on how critical it is and the reason they need to go to this newer version, apply a fix, that seems to be a missing point too, right? That That is a place where I think, uh, Florence, to your point, we need a lot more automation alerting is, is if there is a certain level of a security threat that was fixed, the users need to know with uh, with some notification around here is how critical this is and and here is how we recommend we upgrade it right that that has been a missing piece that's causing a lot of breaches recently yeah. uday it's funny you just said that because i was sitting here thinking there's there's a, multiple pieces of this pie from security mm -hmm. right if you look at supply chain and then security testing and then just regular testing and how we develop things and education of 
our engineers to ensure that they understand. You know, I, my experience is engineers are always trying to do the right thing. Sometimes they just don't know the security implications of what they're doing. And so educating, but then also it's just like, then you have the, the, the management side of thing from an IT or operations or whatever other parts of it. So there's a whole lot of things. So I, I like that you tied that in there to the, to cover more of the pieces of pie. I'm sure there's others I left out. <laughs> so do again, we breathe open source, right? And I'm, I'm an engineer. Like this is something that'd be interesting for me too. Um, are there any open source projects, initiatives, or anything of communities even that are aiming to improve things in the space? Um, you know, speaking like vulnerability scanning, I know like GitHub has like sent me emails on occasion saying, hey, you need to update this package. But um, that's once every few months and then like I usually ignore it, right? Unless it's on um, an important repo, I guess. But um, I guess, are there open source systems which aim to do something similar to that? Which I'm not, I'm not, I have no idea if GitHub's thing is open source, but yeah. Yeah, uh, the, um, there are uh, projects like, in general, like organizations like OWASP or OpenSSF. There are many organizations that work on the security part. OWASP, for example, is an organization that is uh, for a long time supporting open source tools for improving the security, like dependency check, for example, for dependencies, or was Thab for the dynamic uh, security testing. So it has been always there with good information. Uh, in that, in the sense of an organization, and there are many tools that I mentioned, like for example, dependency check or WhatsApp, that uh, are very useful, very easy. They are designed to be integrated on the supply chain. The, the tools are there. Maybe they have to be improved. But the the important thing is, as Uday has mentioned, that maybe more security people should participate in these communities and help uh, including these tools, uh, help using these tools in an intelligent way, not, not only doing a scan and sending the results with uh, 50 pages of findings, but uh, really, really identifying the real vulnerabilities and helping uh, to improve the open source uh, projects. Okay. Um, so I know I'd lost track of time. We only have a minute or two left. Um, anyone have any last words or thoughts they want to share? Yeah. So uh, Anish, let, I mean, let's get back to you. You are the developer, right? You, you are the one that writes code and, and you have a panel of oh, product man. managers, security experts, people <laughs> managers. So what, what do you want from us? What does the developer community want from other experts willing to help you? And how can we help you? Um, I think make it easier for me to understand how to fix something, right? Like, um, again, no offense.